This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. Thank you for, for coming along. Um, so as Rick has already said, <laughs> shame of self-publicity. <laughs> tonight I'm going to talk about the oral history fieldwork and research which culminated in the publication of this book. Um, out in paperback shortly. <laughs> but at a far better price. I thought today, because it is the last in the series of seminars, I'm going to be quite reflective about my oral history research, so as it's not so much the findings, perhaps as more um, undertaking the fieldwork, how that felt, uh, right through to analysis, interpretation, and the writing up process. Um, my research is a rather long, drawn-out process. It took me over five years just to find interviewees. And I thought it might be helpful just to be quite upfront and honest about that process today. Okay, so essentially what we're looking at, what Summerfield and Penniston Bird say about oral history is it's occupying a position at the interface of memory and social and cultural change. So I've adopted this cultural memory approach which focuses on the complex and multiple ways in which people recall their personal histories and how meaning is conveyed through the structure of personal narratives. So my research explored the experiences of second generation Italians who were living in Scotland when Italy declared war on Britain in June 1940. The British government implemented a policy of internment and deportation of Italian men within certain categories, as well as the enforced relocation of women who were living on coastal areas. These were protected areas. They had to move inland with their children. These policies coincided with the enlistment of second-generation Italians into the British forces. This often meant that women um, with Italian parents were often the only people allowed to remain in their homes because they were British subjects. They had British citizenship. So they were often left on the home front to deal with the kind of aftermath of this this situation, the Italophobia of the wartime era. So today I thought I'd look at the personal narratives of Italian Scots and how they reveal um, a sense of difference and of not belonging. And I would argue that this sense of difference predates the Second World War. I want to look at how the war has been remembered and repackaged within the Italian community and why. And also I thought I'd look at the challenges faced by a historian working with oral testimonies when encountering material which, in, which your interviewees may potentially find challenging. In a sense, I mean by that what Summerfield defines as the threat of discomposure, that people often feel comfortable, they compose narratives about their lives, and sometimes the material I was finding was threatening that. Okay, so to start, first of all, I always have to flash up this wonderful, wonderful picture. So this is Geraldo Cozzi, born in 1906. He was the oldest person I ever interviewed. He was in his 90s when I interviewed him. I carried out 44 interviews in total. As you can see, I was prioritising women who were particularly hard to find, so my balance in the end was 25 women, 19 men. They were born between that period of 1906 and 40, but the vast majority were born in the 1920s. The majority were born in Edinburgh, although I did include people who were also born in Glasgow, Stirling, and even London, <laughs> um, but who had spent their lives in Scotland. Of the majority who took part, their fathers had either had ice cream shops or fish and chip shops, and most of them had ended up in the catering trade, not all of them happily. And just to get a sense, what we have with the Italians, essentially, particularly in the first half of the 20th century, is what we call chain migration. So people coming from the same part of Italy tend to end up in the same part of Britain. And in this case, people in Edinburgh tend to come from the, re the province of Frosinone, um, which is now more commonly seen as Lazio. So what I feel, um, as a historian working in Scotland, is there's a tendency to take almost a saccharine approach to the Italian presence there. The figure of the Italian ice cream seller or cafe owner has become an integral feature of Scotland's imagined past, its cultural fabric. So there is a tendency, Alex Salmond is very much part of this bandwagon at the moment, a tendency to romanticise the presence of the Italians in Scotland. 
I just thought I'd flash up. This is uh, a feature article from the 1970s in the Scots magazine, which is kind of a magazine which celebrates Scotland and all things Scottish. And that's just at the side, that is um, my husband's family's fish and chip shop in Harmerdale. <laughs> <laughs> um, but essentially what the Scots magazine says, of all the ways of immigration that have flowed over Scotland, surely the most acceptable <laughs> is that of the Italians. There isn't a town I know of in Scotland without its Scots Italian families. If there is, it can't be much of a town. Mm -hmm. Classic, classic yes. journalistic speak. And also the use of the we won't can't really dwell on this tonight, but the use of the word acceptable is interesting in relation to immigrant groups. Um, you know, some are more acceptable than others, clearly. And so I think within Scottish media, there's a readiness to draw upon this idea of good relations between Italy and Scotland. So we often end up with cliches. This Edinburgh Evening News article says of the Italians, their humour is as rich as their wine, their charm as warm as the sun in any vineyard. They are a gregarious race who since arriving in Scotland have become as closely entwined with Scots society as spaghetti lengths in a bowl. Mm -hmm. So essentially what we have, this common motif running through these descriptions is the idea of Italians bringing the warmth and vibrancy of the Mediterranean to the austere and cold Scottish landscape. I once sat at an event where the director of the Italian Institute said, <laughs> Italian immigrants have enriched the life of Scotland by introducing into what was a Puritan country the delights of Mediterranean cuisine. <laughs> And so I think in these interpretations, everything is quite literally sweetness and light. And I think this state of affairs suits both sides of the equation. As a long established migrant group, the Italians want to dwell on their success stories. As Isabel Bertovemi notes, migrant histories often focus on those who have succeeded in life. Italians also want to forget their participation in interwar fascism which I'm going to return to later. Scots want to forget the level of racist hostility and aggression which was expressed, not just exclusively during the war, but that was the high point. So you'll find that even uh, Scottish-Italian academics will tend to assert a special place for Italians in a, a national hierarchy of belonging. Terry Colpy sees the Italians as in a unique and aristocratic position amongst the immigrant populations of Scotland. So within British Italian historiography, there's a tendency to present the anti-Italian xenophobia of the war as a one-off event, a blip in cordial relations. And in fact, at this event I was just telling you about at the Italian chapel, uh, we were at a concert on Saturday night, the Italian ambassador actually stood up and said, the relationship, the friendship between Scotland and Italy endured even throughout the war. He didn't even qualify it by saying after 1943 it was everything was fine throughout the war. And so I think what we get, the problem here is a failure then, an abdication in the sense of critically examining the multi-layered nature of the prejudice faced by Italians in Scotland throughout the 20th century. In the rush to create positive histories, the complexities of Italian immigrant experience are lost. And I think experiences of racist hostility tend to be sidelined. The overall impact of these dominant representations is to downplay racism and hostility. And I think a failure to address the painful reality of what it felt like to experience the war as someone of Italian origin, when, people, when the Italians clearly were constructed as the enemy within. So I think this is where oral history makes its major contribution. It recovers individual subjective accounts of lived experience. I do want to apologise in a sense for the title I gave to the talk because I didn't set out, I want to get away from this idea that I set out to challenge things. I was very, very naive. I met my husband, he had an Italian background. I was interested, there wasn't much in the library. <laughs> so I just thought, oh, I'll just go out and interview people. I'll, I'll build up the story. Um, and it was more, I was quite shocked and overwhelmed by what people told me and this kind of, these counter narratives began to emerge that contested the kind of received view, I suppose, of what, what was available in the books in the library. 
I also have to admit, when I set out on my fieldwork, I found it incredibly hard to find people to be interviewed. I don't know whether Graham can remember this. <laughs> I received a very poor response to public appeals. I put in newspapers, uh, the Scots magazine, the People's Friend magazine, very, very few replies. And so I had to rely on the snowballing method. I was passed along by word of mouth. And I think this is interesting in itself because it indicates the communal dynamics at work. People did not want to talk about the war. I thought they hadn't been asked, but they genuinely didn't want to talk about it. And it reminds me of, there was an, um, an exhibition on the Italian-Americans called A Secret Story About the War as well. And the organisers of that found similar problems. They said for every door that opened, two slammed in our face. And what they concluded was that silence has been adopted as a protective cover. And I think that was a very, very similar thing that I was encountering. So people, particularly women, were unwilling to be interviewed or apprehensive, shall we say, about making a public account of something that had remained largely private. And again, I think that's quite interesting what it tells us about the war and its impact. I just thought I flashed that on my younger self. <laughs> just This is just to make a point about intersubjectivity, essentially, that we now acknowledge that it isn't just simply about going out and getting the facts from people, it's about the interaction, the dialogical aspect of it. Um, Summerfield has obviously talked about interpersonal dynamics in an interview and how what people think you are can sort of influence the kind of things they think you want to know or that they're going to tell you, whether or not you have shared values. I'm not of Italian origin at all myself, um, but I'm married to an Italian Scot whose parents, no, whose father and grandparents were born in Italy. And that did have massive implications, I think, for the way I was viewed. The sociolo sociologist Anne-Marie Fortier has talked about passing as an Italian, <laughs> which is quite interesting because the amount of t I think I just, well, I was so younger then, so I managed to pass because I had, literally because I had dark hair and brown eyes, that was enough. Language wasn't a factor because no second generation Italians can speak Italian. <laughs> so, you know, that didn't, that wasn't a kind of a barrier at all. The people I was interviewing didn't speak Italian. Um, and obviously the use of my married surname uh, all added to this impression. Some people recognised the surname because my father-in-law was quite a famous footballer and had signed for Celtic just after the, the Second World War, so some people remember that. One person had even been interned with my husband's granddad on the Isle of Man. So there was these little bits of recognition. So this imbued me, I suppose, with an Italian affiliation. And I think people were willing to tell me things which I know that other people who'd gone before me for local exhibitions and stuff, they hadn't been willing to talk to. And even if I would say at the beginning, no, I'm not, I'm not Italian myself, quite apologetically, people would forget that it would become quite blurred. And I remember someone at the very end of the interview saying, I don't know what you feel in your heart you are, but I feel Italian. <laughs> you know, and so but she was clearly thinking that that would be something I would feel too. She was also very pleased to read that day that in the um, this favourite Scottish meal for school children was pizza. So she had beaten chicken balsy or something, so she thought this was the ultimate triumph <laughs> of experience. Okay. And so I think this was important because it built a relationship of trust uh, with those I interviewed, which was invaluable because we were, what I was beginning to dawn on me was I was actually asking people to talk about quite traumatic events. Um, but then that in itself then has consequences for me as a researcher, which I'll return to later. What was interesting about this group of people was when I went along and just said to them, can you tell me about the outbreak of war? Without exception, they would all start in June 1940. They would not start in September 1939. Very, very rarely would they do the Chamberlain broadcast and the wireless, which is kind of a, a trope of the British at war. And again, this reinforces the idea of a set of distinct memories, I think, amongst this ethnic group. So just to get a little bit of context, this is mainly the Scottish situation. Italian immigration begins in earnest around the mid-19th century, um, but you get the real uh, influx at the turn of the century, and it's a kind of a threefold. By the time we get to the outbreak of the Second World War, you have 5,000 Italians in Scotland, 20,000 if you're looking at the GB, uh, Great British population as a whole, 
But if you then include their children, we're looking at an Italian population of about 35,000. Okay. And this is a very well-established community. Sometimes it's in its third generation. And what's interesting about the Italians is many of the children were dual nationals. So they had Italian citizenship because of their father, but obviously they had British citizenship because of where they were born. So what you could say, in a sense, is where, when war breaks out, in a very dramatic fashion, these people have competing allegiances. And for men of military age particularly, the knowledge that they could be called up and then get sent to North Africa, the Middle East or Italy, and be potentially literally fighting their own cousins was hugely problematic. Uh, Salvatore Lagomina, in relation to America, calls this the Tunis Dilemma, the challenge of straddling two cultures. Okay, but we'll return to that later as well. So I think one of the key things I want to mention today is what was emerging from the personal narratives was this sense of growing up in an environment in which Italian Scots felt themselves to be different. They were foreign, alien were the words that they would use. And this is particularly usually uh, forms around religion. Clearly in the Italian case it was Catholicism. Language, that sense of we can't speak Italian in the shop where we're serving customers, so that kind of sense of inhibition. Um, appearance, education. Okay, they often felt they were picked on both by teachers and by fellow pupils. So children of Italian orange origin grew up feeling like outsiders. Um, they experienced a conflict between their external world in neighbourhood and school, and then this internal world at home where their parents were often speaking Italian dialect. Uh, and they were often being served Italian food. One woman said uh, on a Monday morning, mum said, don't say you had macaroni at the weekend, you had roast chicken. You know, this kind of masking of their identity. And so interviewees talked about the harassment that they faced as children, uh, the common insults with macaroni, tally, eye tie. Uh, they were ridiculed for eating worms. And women, I thought it was, it was quite gendered the way people remember, because women would often focus on their physical appearance. There's this kind of idea of racial difference. Um, so they described themselves as dark, sallow skinned, foreign looking. Uh, one woman said, I was a fair skinned, grey eyed Italian, so I didn't stand out like a sore thumb. But the frizzy haired, brown eyed ones with the sallow skin, they got a lot of stick because they were obviously foreign. I think I've, that just links to the metaphor of dirt too. This was something that was often used from the 19th century onwards in these cartoons that Veruska's brought. This idea that the times are somehow dirty, it kind of places them again lower on the racial hierarchy. They were often called dirty Italians. And I think this sense of otherness and difference is crucial to a deeper understanding of the impact then of the war itself. Um, I think the war built up on this kind of sense of not belonging that had already been well forged. Okay. So now I'd like to look at what happened in the war itself. For those who don't know, that's just the very basic skeleton, the internment of over 4,000 men. It's about a fifth of the population. British-born Italians were detained if they'd been involved in fascist clubs. And you can see proportionately with huge numbers in Scotland. The relocation of Italian nationals, mainly women and their children living on the coast. And then famously, I don't know if people are familiar with this, but one of the ships taking people to Canada to internment camp there was torpedoed. Uh, and over 400 Italians drowned, well, obviously other people on board drowned as well. The rolling out of what you could see as kind of official state hostility towards Italians and coincided with popular hostility on the street. So this was anti-Italian riots. You can see here the media reports from Edinburgh. Um, there's this quite nice report here. A journalist went down to one part of Edinburgh where the Italians were kind of based the next day. You can see reminiscent of bomb explosions, it says at the very bottom. So he says he walked down the, the main thoroughfare and it looked as if a series of bombs had dropped. The extent of the devastation was that great. I mean, people had thrown fish counters through windows. Uh, they'd smashed things beyond repair, literally beyond. Some shops never reopened. They defecated in the shops, etc., etc. People went to hospitals who'd been stoned. 
Um, and in a sense, I think this this isn't in a vacuum. This mirrors what happened during the First World War, the anti-German riots of 1915. There's a wonderful analysis by Nicoletta Gulacci. And she says that these riots show the sort of the rapidity with which ethnic groups who've lived amongst a neighborhood for many years can suddenly be recast as the enemy. And she says, and people cannot withstand these new narratives of war. There's very little defense against it. Um, and so she says, in wartime, the living bonds of neighborliness between ethnic groups and the wider community are dramatically undercut by the more emotive notion of who does and who doesn't belong. So as I say, what happened in this situation was women tended to be the people that remained. Uh, fathers were interned, mothers were relocated, brothers often were either detained in prison or went into the army. Um, and so this kind of age group who were too young to go into the forces often stayed and ran the shop. So they're only about 14 years old uh, and felt tremendously isolated. And so I thought I'd just like to play uh, an extract from one interview uh, from one of these women, so it's Rosalina. She was born in Edinburgh in 1919, okay, and this is her experience working on her own in the family shop at the time of the riots. Okay. So, one night, I was in the shop, and I heard an awful noise, people shouting and bawling. So I went to the front shop and stood there, and the next minute, all these people surrounded the shop. I thought it was a clear world. And the next minute, there was a brick through my window, and my best friend, with a basket, clothes basket, taking all the sweeties out of the window. Yeah, yeah. No. And a week previous to that, she had borrowed a dress from me for a dance. I was remember that dress, I know it to this day. And uh, she was filling a soldier and a sailor came forward and said, Are you on your own? I said, Yes. He said, Well, look, you go inside the back of the bag and we'll stay here to make sure that we don't get in. They were scared in case they would attack me. But they weren't interested in that, they were only interested in what was in the cigarettes and sweeties and everything. They cleared me out. Uh, we they stayed until the crowd went further down to the next ice cream shop. So they said, we'll, we'll, we'll close the door, we'll lock up. The crowd was at the bottom, stay up of the shop, and that's fine. And we'll see you up there, and we'll stay there. And that's it, we couldn't do any more than that. I mean, I was confused, I think, from that. I wasn't aware of what happened. So I went upstairs and cried, of course, and I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? So I got a bit to bed. I got up the next morning and walked down the stairs, intending to open the shop. So I stood at the staircase and I looked up and down and I thought, oh, I'm frightened. So I went towards the shop and I just got, went to the padlock and this lady came over and she spat in my face. She says, you Italian, can I say it? You Italian bastard, she says. And the tears and the spit I mean, that's in a sense, you haven't got time. You know, that's a multi layered, I really love that extract because it's so rich. What interests me, the reason I've highlighted it is the way women tended to focus on an item of clothing often when they were talking about what happened to them. So, another woman said she was serving in the shop with a kilt, and a drunk customer comes in and says, You get that effing skirt off, you're not effing British. Another woman whose family, uh, the shop was attacked during the riots and then they were relocated. When they came back from relocation a year later, a customer came in wearing her jumper. <laughs> and she said, I knew the jumper because my mum had hand knitted it to a special pattern. So at that moment, when that child came in wearing her jumper, she knew that that child's father had been one of the people ransacking their kitchen. You know, and so those kind of jolts of, hold on a minute, so it, it's fundamentally destabilising, it kind of, it made these women incredibly vulnerable. They lost their sense of place within the community in which they lived, and that had massive long-term impact, uh, sort of psychic scars. But it's been largely neglected or forgotten about, or it's not really widely discussed or known. 
And so in a sense, what finally I want to turn to is this sense of what has been remembered about the Italians they experienced during wartime and consider the question of who remembers what on behalf of the community and for what purpose. At this point, I've got to say this is... <laughs> Graham was my tutor when I very started out on this research many years ago, and this is something he drilled into me. So my whole research has been kind of guided down that way. Who remembers and for what purpose? <laughs> One of the defining things for the Italians, obviously, we talked about was this Arundora Star sinking. It was Britain's fifth worst maritime disaster. As I say, there were other people on board, German uh, internees, Jewish refugees, British uh, sailors, guard, etc., who drowned as well. I think it was over 800 in total. A lot of the Italians on board had come from the cities where there was most fascist activity. There was lots of fascist secretaries on board, you know, people... Um, so that was the reason they were being deported. They were seen as the most dangerous. But it has to be acknowledged also that MI5 really failed to differentiate them between the fascist secretaries and the people who just kind of turned up at these fascist clubs. They didn't give them any tribunals to test their loyalty, so they just kind of treated them all as one mass. Many people swapped places at the last minute. It took them months to find out who'd been on board. It was a massive tragedy. And so now sociologists would say that the, the present-day community almost defines itself by grief over the lives lost on the Arundora Star. And increasingly, since the 1980s, but even more so in the last decade or so, it has become a kind of the centrepiece of communal memory. So we start in the 1960s with this statue by Mancini in St. Peter's Church here in London. We had a mosaic, went up privately in the Casa d'Italia, that's a social club in Glasgow in 1975, with the Novi Scoderemo Mai, We Will Never Forget You. It's quite interesting, there's an Italian-Scottish play where she uses that motif as well, this idea, the urge to remember. The community is beginning to tell the community what they have to remember. More recently, as I say, we've had memorials being set up across Britain. So it starts in 2008. Alex Salmon announces that we're going to have a memorial garden in Glasgow to the Arundora Star, the wartime shame. In Liverpool, when Liverpool was a city capital culture, this European thing, it kind of uh, negotiated with Italy to do this uh, memorial mass, set up a plaque on the pier head, went out on a ferry, and threw a wreath into the sea to signify where the Arundel Star had left from. Then we have Middlesbrough. It sets up its plaque in 2009 and says, well, actually, I think it's 13 people from Middlesbrough lost their lives, including, actually, you can see Rhea, Camilla Rhea, the Chris Rhea, people oh, of a certain yeah. age, his family. <laughs> um, so what's happening here? And then Cardiff, and um, the 70th anniversary, has this massive cathedral the celebration and commemoration, they unveil their own plaque to the Arundora Star too. I mean, we could go on for ages to this, I find this all memorialisation fascinating, who's involved and why it's often grandchildren. It's not often the second generation who are involved, because they kind of know the complexities, but the next generation down just think it's an outrage and an injustice, and so they're more motivated. But I think, in a sense, what happens here is we begin, this begins to distract. It's an empathetic story, it's about suffering, it's about loss. And if we begin to focus on this exclusively, then the complexity of Italian experience is lost. In particular, I would argue, what falls from the commemorative picture is fascism. And the fact that there was quite a lot of support for Italian fascism um, across Britain, but particularly, I think, again, I think it was taken up quite uh, widely in Scotland. You can see here as early as 1924. I think the Glasgow Fascist Club was one of the first to be set up in Britain, um, literally just months after the March on Rome. Um, and these were, you know, had very, very tight links back uh, with Rome and the Bureau for Italians Abroad. They were meant to remain, members were meant to remain loyal to Italy and not integrate. They had to sign an oath of allegiance to Mussolini. And so by the mid 1930s, almost 50% of Italian men in Scotland are members of the fascist party. You can see here there's some newspaper cuttings from the Scotsman, so showing in both Edinburgh and Aberdeen. Um, you know, the engagement in commemorative events, they often celebrate the um, Italian armistice of the 4th of November. 
Um, language schools were set up to encourage the second generation to speak Italian. There were propaganda films about uh, Ethiopia and the Spanish Civil War shown in local cinemas in Scotland. There was little youth camps set up where uh, Mussolini's government would subsidise the children of Italians to go back to Italy and march up and down with little dummy guns. Um, <laughs> So in a sense, what you're getting is a very confident display of Italian Italianness um, here during the, the Ethiopian conflict, when obviously Britain imposed sanctions on Italy because of their invasion. There was collections amongst the Italian diaspora, and so here's the local At Edinburgh Italians very proudly showing how they've been collecting gold and wedding rings to help Mussolini's cause. So I would say that in a sense, this activity was contributing to an an external identification of the Italian presence as fascist. Not many people were that involved. It was mainly an elite. I recognise all these characters here. They were the most wealthy, rich Italians, most commercially successful. They accepted honours from Mussolini, uh, collected money from Mussolini. But there were other people who just kind of went along because it was a safe, gendered space for the children to go. Unfortunately for them, MI5, the security services, weren't willing to make any distinctions. They, they compiled lists in the 1930s um, that said, it was kind of called Arrest Italian Fascist was the code name, and they said as soon as Italy declares war, we arrest these people. And this, as we know, had devastating consequences because a lot of these men ended up on the Arundora Star. And ironically, not all of them, often the fascists ended up on the Isle of Man were safe. It was a real mix. So I think what's happened with community memory communal memory is it's often those whose families were involved in the fascist clubs who have dominated memory because they're the most wealthy and the most well known so the media always goes to them for the stories of what it means to be Italian so they tend to create this narrative oh it was, it was terrible during the war we were interned then you know, people drowned on the Arundora Star there was, there was this thing called the fascist club but it was like the scouts you know I mean it's you know that's these kind of like language is always used to depoliticize what was happening. So being interned comes to mean what it meant to be Italian during the war, and this in a sense then excludes and marginalizes the stories of other people in the community, the non-internees. Okay, we, when we looked at internment, it was only actually a fifth of the population were interned, so you have this massive four-fifths of the population, what was happening to them. But in this focus, on the Arundora Star, these stories again get lost. Italian historians, uh, often when they write about the war, don't even mention that men and women went into the British forces. It's kind of omitted from the story. Terry Colby does touch upon it briefly, and this is how she puts it. This is when she discusses men who went into the army. She says they were forced to throw off their heritage shake themselves adrift of their roots and pretend to be something they were not. And I, I think that's an incredibly valued judgment. Mm -hmm. And this is in the most popular history book on the Italian presence in the UK, and that's in it. Mm -hmm. um, and she just then she says, but those who are interned, and this is like, was it 600 max? Those who are interned were um, determined to remain united with their roots and with the community. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. So I would say that here there's a subtext going on about who is a good Italian, who's a bad Italian, which almost links itself to how the fascists used to talk about themselves. Because they used to be, you know, he's a good Italian because he collects money from Mussolini, and somehow the good Italians have become the internees, and the bad Italians is the men who went into the, the army. I interviewed an internee, this is a classic case, Renzo from the Scottish borders. He renounced his British nationality before the war and said he wouldn't shave his beard in internment until Italy won. Hence, he never shaved his beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but one of the things he said, and he stayed, he refused to come out, even when Italy switched sides, he refused. He thought that was, um, you know, dishonourable. And what he said about his peers who went into the army, a lot of them died to brook Italian boys fought against their own brothers. Okay, so this idea again of disloyalty. It links into evidence you can find from uh, archives that um, people who were detained, there was a hairdresser from Glasgow called Gilda Camillo, 
Uh, and she was found to be encouraging people not to go into the British forces. And apparently in her letters that they found, she'd said that her cousins in the British forces were a dirty shower of bastards. And her cousin in the British uniform was a traitor. Okay. So what I find interesting, having interviewed a lot of men and women who went into the British forces, is again, it's far more complicated than it has been presented Essentially, an analysis of veteran testimonies shows that they have both positive and negative experiences in the British military, um, which ultimately, I think, made them feel more Italian too. Um, they could often be verbally abused. At roll call in the morning, someone said that every day the sergeant major would make a joke of his silly Italian name. But then on the other side, people were asked to liaise with Italian prisoners of war so they could be used in a positive way. What I liked most and what I found most interesting about the veterans that I interviewed was how they would have this dual identification in their narratives. So they would often be able to identify with both Britain and Italy interchangeably as they talked about their wartime experiences. So I think this signifies, in a sense, a split in their self-identity, what I would say was a hybrid sense of self. So rather than Terry Colby's idea that you have to be one or the other, you have to be for the Italians or against the Italians, actually identity is more complex, it's more plural, more multiple, etc. I thought, we're coming near the end, but I thought I would just like to play this one. This is Angelo Valenti, as you can see, he went into the Royal Army Medical Corps and uh, worked out in Italy. So this extract is when he'd arrived um, in Italy, Christmas 1944. Okay, it's quite quiet when it starts, but then he'll, you should be able to hear him after a while. So I just love that to bits. I know it's a tiny extract, but here's a man sitting in his British army. He's just invaded Italy. He's sitting on a mountaintop, Christmas. And he claims that's our, that's our music. He, he wants to be seen as Italian. But I love also the plum duff. I love that because my granddad used to never say Christmas pudding, he would always say plum duff. And so there's the signals again of both so he's able to be both at the same time, and he doesn't find that problematic. And so I think that's what's been lost in the current historiography, which hasn't actually listened to the, gone out and interviewed the people themselves. So in a sense, as I say, I think they've been largely overshadowed by the Arundora star, and I think in a sense, particularly the men who died fighting for Britain have been left and stranded in this commemorative no man's land, I mean, unloved by the Italian community. And finally, just before we close, I just thought I'd just mention the ethical problems, I say, issues that I had, was that obviously uncovering all this kind of information and becoming increasingly aware of complexity. I did struggle quite a lot when I came to write up. Um, I found it quite inhibiting. I, I interviewed a lot of daughters of Arundora Star victims, although the Arundora Star was never something I was particularly focusing on. And some, I went to see some two sisters and they had been they lost their father on the Arundora Star 
And their mother died three, day, three years later in what they called a broken heart. And that wasn't, you know, lots of women said that kind of thing. My mother died a few years later, uh, the stress, the anxiety. So um, Portelli has this beautiful phrase where he says he can, he can meet grown adults who are kind of frozen to the moment of grief. That they've become this event, this traumatic event has happened and they are perpetual orphans. And I literally sometimes felt this. And that is hard to... The impact that those those particular women, it's always this particular two sisters, because they sat, they were living, when I went to interview them, they were sitting in their grandmother's flat because they'd had to go and live with their grandmother once they'd lost both their parents, and they'd never left, and they'd never married. And it just felt almost, it was this frozen in time. So what I found when I'm writing up, doing all my clever, clever historical stuff about, mm. oh, you know, isn't this just a myth, and is, don't we need to talk about fascism? They lost their dad on that ship. Do you see, and it's something they've lived with, and it was some and other women too, not just those. And so I have found that part of oral history research problematic. It's something I've had to wrestle with. Ethnographers talk about how self censorship can creep in sometimes when you're writing because you begin to think, how are they going to react to this? Mm -hmm. There is a positive. I can come back if anyone has questions about that. But there is a kind of a positive end to that story because I had to go back and see everyone again 10 years on uh, to get permission to, to do the book and um, because of all the memorialisation of the Arundel Star which had occurred in the intervening period they were actually all a lot more comfortable with the past nothing to do with me <laughs> but they felt that they were being listened to and their loss had been acknowledged and recognised so that was an interesting change so things change and shift Okay, so just to close, um, I think what I wanted to say was essentially that men and women of Italian origin in Scotland who lived through the war offer hybrid constructions of personal identity which emerge in oppositional ways to what we think of as the British at war. They also offer a more complicated idea of Italian experience during the Second World War. But I think in this present day culture where we celebrate and romanticise the Italians, we tend to overlook the traumatic nature of wartime events and its long term psychic scars are often ignored. So I would say that um, personal narratives show the extent to which the war heightened a sense of not belonging amongst second generation Italians and a sense of exclusion and marginalisation which did persist in the post war decades. So they often said we kept our heads down. Um, and so rather than simply celebrating the Italian presence, which obviously is important, I think that via the use of oral history, the experiences of the Italian population during the war can help illuminate the complex ways in which ethnicity interacts with a sense of belonging uh, to a nation at a time of conflict. And I do genuinely hope that these experiences can also help identify the readiness of British society to target and identify the internal other at a time of national crisis or anxiety. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent presentation. Thank you. Very close to my heart, of course. <laughs> 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 so, um, has anybody got any questions? Or I can start one off. <laughs> can you think of something? Shall I? Um, I guess one thing I was interested in in your research, uh, because I collected quite a number of hours of Italians, about 100 hours, um, here in, in London, in Little Italy, in Clerkenwell. Um, what I found a lot that was interesting was the, how the sense of being Italian was fostered by the Mazzini Garibaldi mm. uh, narrative. So, yeah. uh, Mazzini was the sort of um, intellectual father of the Italian nation, and he came here as an exile uh, in the 19th century and set up Italian schools. I don't know what happened in Scotland, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, that sense of uh, the Italian you know, identity, the collective identity was already kind of fostered by, mm -hmm. you know, the schools of teaching people Italian, mm -hmm. teaching them about the revolution and all of that, you know, or the fight for freedom. So, did you compare or contrast the different narratives of what it meant to be Italian in a public discourse between before the war and those people that identified with Mazzini Garibaldi, those that then identified with the fascist era? 
Not, no, not really. I mean, interestingly, I don't know whether the Mazzini Garibaldi Club was then appropriated by the fascists it in was. the interwar period. Yeah, it so was. it becomes yes. again, it becomes something that's filtered through the fascist gaze. But they wouldn't have used in Scotland. They wouldn't have been using Mazzini Garibaldi. That was that never mentioned. You know, there was even those motifs or the idea of Italianness meaning something else besides Mussolini. This is what was quite interesting about it because often, people often ask me, "Oh, what about the anti-fascists?" And it really wasn't, it was this very much fossilised identity that people, and re- across the range of experience, even men that had fought in the British army and thought the fascists were silly fools, would still say Mussolini did wonderful things for Italy. He drained the marshes, he made the trains run on time, he sorted out the mafia, and he improved the education system. So. There was, this, there was no anti-fascist narrative and there was certainly no other beyond that. Although the fascist, I know this from doing documentary research, the fascists in Glasgow appropriated Garibaldi entirely so that when elderly Italians died in Glasgow, they would often, if he was a Garibaldian veteran, they would use that. You know, so that would be the big thing. They would all, in the black shirts, there'd be a funeral procession and they'd march through the streets of Glasgow and say, this is a red shirt and now Italian, this is the black shirt. So I think that would probably happen more in Glasgow and it certainly wasn't anything that came through in my Mm. Edinburgh interviews but what was interesting for me was that it really was, they hadn't even moved beyond the armistice. (laughs) Just, I mean, they didn't even make use of the resistance and you know how in Italy the the joke is you can never find a fascist now Mm. in post-war Italy because everyone was anti-fascist or... But they didn't even make use of that. The, what they would just they would just say Mussolini did wonderful things, and then say it was just a social club. It didn't yeah. had no political mm. meaning. It was like well, one the best one was it was like say Andrews Society. So they yes. would yeah. compare it to different diasporic mm. societies and associational culture. And the people I interviewed uh, who had been children, you know, mm-hmm. during the war, they, they would say things like, oh, you know, we went to Italy for free because yeah. the Mussolini, you know, if you can make them fascist, they <laughs> send the kids to Italy for yeah. the first time and then they would uh, learn to be, yeah, you know. Yeah, that was the, one of the key fascist. ethical problems I had, was I was mainly interviewing people who had been children. So they were attending as children and recalling that as 70, in their 70s and 80s. So really... From their point of view, it was just a social club. It was where they went to see their friends. It was where they sang around the piano and played football. And so I had to be very careful not to be the clever, knowing historian because I was obviously having access to MI5 files and all, you know, his, all the books that said this is actually what they were. They'd say things like, oh, yeah, it was quite funny that Mussolini was on the front of all our books. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? And I'm going, hmm, you know, and sort of like, yeah, because I know that this is a massive propaganda initiative, and you know, it's not being done half-heartedly, there's, there's reasons for this. But when I'm writing that up, I can't, it's a big ethical thing, isn't it? You can't be derogatory or make the people you're interviewing look silly. And so I had to be very, when I was analysing it, I had to be very much, this is how it was remembered mm. for them, because they were children, And even, I'll probably do all the documentary analysis and what it meant quite at a distance from the narratives because I didn't, I really didn't want to make them look Mm. silly. Although interestingly, when I went, as I say, when I went back to see these sisters to ask their permission to tell them about the book, and they were far more cheery and in a better place (laughs) 10 years later. But I said, I feel I have to say, you know, I am going to talk about fascism in this book. I just for that, I felt particularly responsible to them. So I said, I'm going to talk about fascism in the book. And she just went, oh, that Mussolini had a lot to answer for. That was Mussolini had a lot to answer yeah. for. So it kind of... Shifted, yeah, it? so she... So none of them, as she, recalling their experiences adults, none of them kind of reflected on the fact that Mussolini, you yeah, know, this wasn't a great society, none of them sort of... No, they didn't try to, they didn't try to engage. Regardless of their own experience, they were all positive about Mussolini. Mm. They, they would, they could laugh about the fascists in Edinburgh. Mm. Idiots, fools, what were they up to? They shouldn't have done that. But they, 
they reve- they they're amazing. They really because it just shows the impact that it had in that sense. If he made them feel better because they were they were dirty Italians, they were poor, they were laughed at, they were ridiculed. He had actually made them feel better about what it meant to be Italian, and that that seeps through, I think, mm. and it is that kind of in aspic almost that particular period of time. They don't filter it. It's really it's quite odd. Mm. I wonder about the layers of migration actually made in this as well because we've got the schemes from 45 onwards to the scheme 48 bringing Italians across the map yeah. and they're going, to be quite, they're going to be different aren't they yeah. from the, from the yeah. people who are already here and I've not really been able to work out how, you know, how that existing diaspora and the new wave of migration can actually even get on <laughs> and you know, look at Bradford what you've got there is that that those Italians who come across are more likely to probably marry Ukrainians than English. And so all these sort of odd things mm-hmm. start to happen. And uh, you know, looking at sort of the Ukrainian fascists who arrived in 1948, um, their first preference is to marry some of Ukrainian. Mm-hmm. Their second preference is to marry some of Italian. Um, and I think it's really, really interesting. And and behind that, if you look at the sort of why does that? Why, why does the British, this British Labour government, write fascist to Britain? And one of the reasons it's been put forward by American historians is this notion of whitewashing Britain. Mm. Mm. So this idea yeah. that the Italian state, the states of Italians and the states of white Eastern European and Austrian, in fact, Austrian refugees brought across as well, sort of changes about 1948 um, because of this sort of idea of counterbalancing that with mm. the, 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 the Commonwealth. Migration. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that's. I mean, Wendy Webster's big idea is about the hierarchy of belonging, and mm-hmm. she says what changes after the war is the unsuitable sort of the dirty Irish, particularly who everyone like detested in the nineteenth century, are now top of the hierarchy, yeah. and then you have your other white Europeans following through, your Italians, Polish, Lithuanians, even the fascist Ukrainians, yeah. because. What they don't want is the actual British subjects, colonial subjects, coming in. They actively recruit from displaced persons camps yeah. because they want to maintain whiteness and they discourage the entry of people from the Commonwealth. But how is that read by the existing Italian diaspora? I mean, I'll tell you how it's read by the existing Ukrainian diaspora. Mm-hmm. It happens again in the 90s, is that they just, you know, it's, it's, they just look down on these mm-hmm. people. They come here with empty suitcases so they can fill them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, this is like a set piece. As I was invited to a Scottish Italian charity event, <laughs> it was really, really funny actually because I thought I was going to see all these ind- individual women who were all sort of depressed and low, and then I went to this charity event. And they were all like up at the front in the disco, so that was the learning curve too. And <laughs> um, but at this event, there was lots of new Italians, mm. so that also they meant post-war Italians who again were reaching third generation by this point you know they've been here for 60 years but were new Italians Mm -hmm. and they didn't Mm -hmm. like their ostentatiousness they were being too loud who was too loud they all the new Italians were too loud so the elderly Italians who were born in Scotland in the 20s were watching these new Italians (coughs) probably in their 60s but had been here since the 1950s or whatever and they were saying they don't know they don't know what we went through yes. and if they knew what we went through they wouldn't behave like that mm. and they didn't even like them giving their shops Italian names mm. because they'd been brought up in an environment where you anglicised mm. your name mm. Marandola becomes Moran mm. do you see what I mean yeah, yeah, and that yeah. again that predates the war Colby says it was because of the war but doesn't it predates the war yeah. and so they're kind of like Mm. It's a gap of comprehension. It's a, gen- yeah, a massive yeah. generational gap. When when I was doing my interviews, I was paid by the Italian, uh, the Christian Italian Association of Workers, uh-huh. you know, Acli and uh, they're called they're right next to the Italian Church in Clerkenwell. And um, so when I was looking for interviewees, I had mm-hmm. two options: either to go to one club on a Wednesday, where the British Italians, the Cockney Italian, would go to. Or on a Thursday, you'd have the post-war Italian would go to a different club because mm. they didn't actually mix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and they still don't mix yeah, today. Yeah. And so this is why I asked you the question about the Mazzini Garibaldi mm. identity because 
the ones who speak in Cockney Italians that didn't appear as many Italians to me to begin with, you know, they um, they just are different from mm. your mm. regular post-war Italian yeah. that came over after the war, doesn't want to talk about politics, so they keep their head down, they yeah. just want to hang out and eat, and eat nice Italian food, whereas the others, they're quite political in a way, yeah. aren't they, even if they join the fascist club. They want to celebrate being Italian, they run the Mazzini Garibaldi Club for like 150 years or something. You know, they have another sense of wanting to really belong in a way mm. that the others don't. Mm. That's, that's what I felt. Where did you fit in? Where did you want to fit in a school like you with either group? Uh, well, I guess I have one good example that I interviewed the sister of a famous gangster in, in London, uh-huh. uh, Albert Times, who changed his name. He was called Alberto Di Mary, but he wouldn't be accepted otherwise mm. before the war. You know, they okay. came over. Yeah. They came down from Scotland, actually. Oh, right. and I think they <laughs> Typical. He settled in London. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you would want to hear this interview. And so I'm talking to her and she gets really annoyed with me when she says, what's the name of the wife of the Italian king? And I go, what do you mean? She's like, well, you know, and she got really offended that I didn't know, but of course I was born in 1974 and we didn't have the monarchy and the monarchy is despised in Italy because of the collaboration with Mussolini. But for her, it was like terrible. What kind of Italian am I? I don't know about the monarchy. Like, oh. Yeah. And so there, there was a massive gulf, but I was very accepted mm-hmm. by the fact that I have an Italian name. Mm-hmm. No, I don't have an Italian name, I have an Italian surname. Mm-hmm. Um, I, the doors opened yeah. and everyone told me their stories, but I, I wasn't actually really an insider, uh-huh. in a way, yeah. you know, uh-huh. because my, my sense of identity is completely different to, yeah. to theirs, yeah. really. I mean, I think that's right about the sense of being Italian or wanting to claim Italianness, because I was interviewing pensioners in little tenement flats in Edinburgh, some of whom had never been to Italy. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they would say, I'm Italian. Yeah, we're in here, and that's like entirely legitimate, but it was absolutely fascinating. Some of them were going to Italian language classes at the local council, so they were learning mm-hmm. Italian mm-hmm. for the first time. And it's worth saying that all of my interviews were done in English. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Apart from maybe one or two, mm-hmm. um, like the owner of uh, Bar Italia, we did in Italian because obviously we well educated, very powerful mm-hmm. character, <laughs> you know, so these kind of people were educated but the rest couldn't, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. couldn't be interviewed in Italian actually. Mm-hmm. No, I, I genuinely think they thought I was. Even if you said no? Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. believe you. Yeah, so. yeah. Because just the name, I mean, I'm not saying everyone recognised the name, but it was quite a potent name for particularly yeah. blokes, obviously a footballer. Yeah. And one of them, the, the bloke with the beard, said when he got out of internment camp, so he stayed there longer than he needed to, so he comes out of internment camp in 1945, and he reads that Ugolini's been signed for Celtic. And he goes... Two fingers to the British because we we Italians have triumphed. I don't know. My father in was thinking about it in that term. But you see, so it had a potency. My name, and I did bump into one in a supermarket once with my husband, and she went, "He's not, what, you know, he's not Italian because my husband's quite fair." So she was still willing to embrace me far more as someone who could possibly be Italian than him. <laughs> it was like, who's this? You've been tricking me. So yeah, I, I really I I interviewed a lot of women who'd been approached by museums in Edinburgh and had given either refused to be interviewed or were given very very sparse interviews. You see what I mean? And they they were different for me. And I think it's because of the identity. And I think they did begin to trust me because what happened was I was passed along. They would kind of check me out and then they would pass me along. But then what then that made me feel was hugely responsible, you know, because by the end of it I felt like I had all these people's stories mm. and lives. Mm. And I mean, I was going to say, I, I've read, of course, the article you said, <laughs> so well, a little bit more than they do, but, you know, um, my experience of working with migrant and refugee groups collecting oral histories, mm-hmm. it's always about who you know, mm-hmm. you know, when you never go to the newspaper or mm-hmm. anything like that, because these communities, they just don't go and, and yeah. appear to those, even if they're well integrated, it is the community centre, yeah. yeah. and it is who you know, so I have a feeling that once you were introduced, that was it, they would have embraced you, just because of the nature of Italian culture, yeah. it's very yeah. collective. I think it's, it's true of, of 
mind in groups anyway, because you become an insider because you know the stories, you know the stories. You, you know, you, you get knowledge as you do the interviews, mm. you go along, it's not just being passed along, it's also that you begin to understand the nuances of what you're being told. Mm. And I think that's where you start becoming an insider, even if you don't necessarily use that in your questions, I think it's picked up in your responses. You know, you know the follow-up question, you know to ask for more about this, yeah. you know to tread carefully about that, you know to, you know, and I think people, yeah. people just pick that up. Mm -hmm. People pick that up, and, and you're interested. Mm. And you're interested in a way that, that it's, not, it's not on the level of, you know, I'm going to come in, steal your photo wall and disappear, you're actually going to be sitting there for a few hours. You know, and people may be doing the project for some time, yeah. so I think it's a sort of, you know, something else, and that makes it even more difficult, I think, to write up. Mm. You know, when it gets to write up, it really is quite tricky where you're making judgments. I mean, one of the things we did with Ukraine is we went back and we said, here's what we think, and they said, no, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you get, what was your feedback like? Or? It's been amazingly positive. I mean, bless them, some of them have even bought the book. You know, which is yeah. huge, horribly expensive at the moment, and I've got letters, and they've passed it on, and they've given it to non-Italian friends. I mean, no, this isn't all of them. I mean, a lot of them have sadly have died because there was quite a gap between yeah. interviews and publication. But now I've been, I've been relieved because I don't think I've let them down, yeah. but I've still managed to said what I want, I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah. So I am quite chuffed, and I've had emails from relatives in Canada. You know, so they've. People have told family in Canada and America, and they've emailed back and said, "Oh, you know, we're going to get hold of your book because Grandma said this and that." Mm -hmm. So it has amazingly been positive. But I have to say, there has been all this memorial. You know, they've been invited to lots of events. Like, <laughs> there's a wonderful video on YouTube of the Liverpool thing, the ferry, and then behind there's this little pensioner who <laughs> behind the vicar, and it's Rena who I interviewed. You know, and she's so she's gone all the way to Liverpool just to, do you see what I mean, yeah, to be yeah. part of this. Flora, who I interviewed and was terribly traumatised, and she'd been interviewed by the local paper. And I went back ten years later, and she was delighted she'd been introduced to the Pope. Mm. Do you see what I mean? She, and she'd sort of said, I feel like I've done my dad proud. So being interviewed by me was just one part of what she was up to. Do you see what I mean? In a yeah. sense, her wider mission was to get her dad's story out. And so, in a sense, maybe I'm over-inflating my own importance by worrying all the time, because actually, yeah. she was proactively going mm. out. I've I found letters she's written to the local paper, actually, since my dad was lost at sea. Well, I wish it was a moment of time as well, in terms of when you were interviewing, because, you know, it's becoming more acceptable. I'm not told you this, by the way, but my uncle was actually involved in the Aberdeen riot. Um, and remember, remember, him telling me, quite, he was quite ashamed of it actually, he was late about being in the fish and chip shop, smashing it through the shop, you know. But you know, he was he was a full time official for the EU, we can't find him in the Congress Party. There was quite a fascist identity, wasn't there, in yeah, Aberdeen, I absolutely. think? Yeah. And he always told that story as an anti fascist yeah, yeah. Uh, no, story, but, but <laughs> really racist, you know. Um, but remember, claims to remember stamping on Mussolini's portrait. Shop, you know, so, you know, <laughs> yeah. Whether it's true or not, yeah. I mean, you know, but it's, 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 it's interesting that maybe, I mean, I think you began interviewing, or by the time you were interviewing, he would have been dead. Mm -hmm. You know, and I wonder if there's a generational thing happened there as well, where yeah. you could actually do that work and things have changed sufficiently. Well. There's an interesting, on the, again, on the internet where they talk about the Glasgow riots and the Scottish people talking about it, and they start off saying, I'm quite ashamed of what I did, and then people begin to. Yeah, well, actually, they were fascists. Yeah. Do you, do you see what I mean? And it's quite interesting yeah, to follow it, was, it down. That all it all reemerges. Where was that? I was on the internet. I mean, it's still there. I can get the link yeah. for you. So that happened about five years ago. That conversation. But for me, the moment in time is hugely important because I was doing interviews after Bosnia Herzegovina, mm -hmm. and so people would say it was just like that. Our neighbours turned against us. Mm -hmm. Then I, it was during the Serbian crisis and the Albanians and the ethnic cleansing. So women would say the relocation was like ethnic cleansing. Mm -hmm. And my last interview, I always remember this, it was about two weeks before 9 11 because I was really heavily pregnant and I was coming to an end after five long years. And I remember thinking after 9 11 in Edinburgh, the local mosque was, there was a firebomb and all the Asian shops were smashed that night. And I knew that that 
would just get would set off all the Italian people I'd interviewed. Would that would really be unsettling for them and troubling? And I think I doubt whether these people would now be willing to be interviewed. Mm-hmm. Because when I um, during the Serbian crisis, I had an interview lined up with a woman who'd been Italian in the land army, and she phoned me up and said, "I don't want to do the interview because." Russia said that they might support Serbia and there's going to be another war and if I do the interview with you and people know I'm Italian my son might be interned wow. isn't that mate? Yeah. even though we were part of the EU yeah. at this point yeah. she thought that would yeah. crumble in. and her husband who was Polish when he saw the transcript said to her you shouldn't, I did eventually interview he said we shouldn't let her publish this because we'll lose our house. Because you know she was telling me about people who'd beaten her up in the land army and stuff, and he said that you know oh no if people if you let her publish we'll lose our house because he had that vulnerability as a Polish exile, mm. you know. And so it was quite ama- that for me really summed it up. She said I don't want to be exposed as an Italian because if there's another war my son will be interned. You can understand the fear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How old was her son at the time? Then? In his forties. What does that generation do? You said something earlier about the older generation. Mm-hmm. We're talking about the ones who are young now. Yes. How do they feel about their children? Again, I get a lot of the children, so because I get invited a lot of the Italian mm-hmm. Institute and things like that. So you know, and again, a lot of the children of the interviewees turn up, and again, they're they're fine about it but often these events are about the hour and door star I'm invited to talk you know and again so I find it quite hard um, and in Wales particularly the hour and door star campaign was set up by third generation and the way they talk about it is they were just innocent victims this is used so a lot they've kind of lost over the fascist yeah thing, yeah yeah, yeah. So they were just there's, the, there's websites from bbc wales that just say <laughs> ice cream sellers you know they, yeah. were, they were just ice cream sellers and <laughs> um, you know and then they horribly died and so then the british government you know is kind of like to blame for this horrible thing happening did the, did the british government apologize for yeah, are they, well, they say there was no apology, and there was a campaign for an apology. But if you look at the records, yeah. Herbert Morrison stood up at the time and apologised. He apologised to those who were mistakenly on board, <laughs> <laughs> and he says this is appalling and it should never have happened. So, because they did, there was a handful of naturalised Italians on board. So he apologised for that, and they did give compensation out, but. So there has been an apology, but it's not the apology that the Italians want. I'm not sure about these apologies, what, what the I point is. It's like Jeremy Hunt stood up today and apologised about Jimmy Savile, I know. I, know. I, don't, I don't like apologies what at all. What does it mean? I know. It's really Jeremy Hunt should apologise for us. I mean, I guess if you were, you know, if you experienced it yourself, it would be different. I mean, I spoke to a lot of Italians here in London, you know, British Italians who are expecting this apology. And they, but they, they, they talk so about it all the time. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And they, and, uh, this big myth, which isn't a myth, but this idea of yeah. grabbing onto the grief that you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, it's very strong there. The whole of Andorra star is yeah. still yeah. very painful. Someone I interviewed who was a second generation, but his father wasn't on the Andor stop, but he's, ta- he's a rich businessman and he's taken it upon himself to campaign for an apology. So he set up a website and everything. Mm-hmm. And he phoned me up and said, you know, you're gonna, do you want to lend your support to this? And I had to say no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, again, I, mean, I had to, I just had my baby, I remember at the time. So I was kind of, oh, I was probably able to cope with it better. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I was just in that completely zoned out zone. I just said, oh, as a historian, I don't support yes, apology campaigns, which I don't. I don't. I wouldn't say uh, we should apologise for the famine or no slavery on cow. <laughs> Very hard. Did you interview family? So you interviewed some of your in-laws, did you? I started off with my father-in-law. And did that go into your reading? Did that go into the book? Or? I don't know if he does appear, actually. 
he wasn't a very good interview because <laughs> he was a footballer and he's he's always been interviewed. He's not as good playing bloody football. <laughs> not much. <laughs> there's endless, there's reams of stuff about him playing football. Mm. He's just died, actually, bless him. So there's lots of obituaries yeah. online at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was his name? Rolando Ugolini. I interviewed. I did his brother Romeo. So I've. My husband's got an uncle called Romeo, which I think is wonderful. But <laughs> Uncle Romeo, he was in the army, so he gave me this amazing... He refused to fight overseas, so they put him in the Pioneer Corps mm-hmm. down south, and he had the best time in the world. He went to Italian restaurants in Soho, <laughs> and he says he slept with every woman in Slough. Slough! <laughs> 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 But then when, when I got home and the my husband had taken me, I, it hadn't recorded. Oh. It was the only time that's ever happened because Auntie oh. Ella came in and started talking and I put it on yes. pause and then I didn't yeah. press. I pressed that play. always happens yeah. once, doesn't it? Once. Yeah, once. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when I went back, I did, he very kindly agreed to do it again, but it was just flat. And he didn't mention any of the women in Slough. He really didn't. He said, I've told you that already. I was going to ask that. You had told the interview was actually RAMC. Yes. Yeah. Was that a preference? Was yes. That, uh, was you joined like the Quakers, you joined? Yeah, that was his, the way, again, the way they, they took, the way I talk about, they negotiate their presence in the army. They have to justify it retrospectively because so of this. Yeah. Yeah. So he said, yeah. You know, I went, my senior officer said, Angelo, we're going overseas, you could get shot, what do you want to do? And he went, oh well, if I'm in the medical corps, at least I'm helping save lives, they're not taking them. And then he just said, well, all the Italian-Americans were in anyway at that point, so if you were warm, you are in. That's how, it was just interesting, he, he would have been quite happily, he happily went into the army, but he still had to frame it. Yeah. As well, I did it for these reasons because I could say this. Other people said I didn't go in until my mother came back from relocation, or I went in after my dad was released from internment camp. So even if the two weren't actually administratively connected, mm-hmm. it was important to them talking about it that they made that link. Mm-hmm. Because I do think they still they feel judged. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I haven't been in the British Army. Speaking about the traditions of Italians in Scotland, do they have a procession as well? Like no, it's, yeah. it's all very... Not in Edinburgh, again, it might be the case more so in Glasgow, but mm. I'm not aware of it. it you know, it, we don't have that sort of that more visible culture yeah. that mm. you have in London. Yeah. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. And I think that's maybe to do with anti-Catholicism as well in Scotland, yes. sectarianism. Yeah. That's what you might get in Glasgow, though, not in Edinburgh. Oh, the processions. Yeah, it's, it's, it's we have Italian archbishops and stuff in Glasgow. Yeah. You yeah. see what I mean? So who, I push, uh, who push a lot of this memorialisation yes. as well. You know, so there is a different dynamic. I see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, well, think about, you know, one of the things we've done with, with the Ukraine is we've gone back three times to the community. And we started off with Rob Pouch, that's the start off with older Ukrainians, and I came in the second generation, and then we went to the third grandchildren of the primary settlers. And it is really interesting about how ethnicity itself is negotiated over those three generations. Mm. So like you know, your, your idea of it somehow the politics becomes flattened out, it's more to do with the sort of cultural representations mm. of being Ukrainian mm-hmm. um, in the third generation that it does. Mm-hmm. And what an anthropologist he called the sort of tokenism. He didn't mean it in, mm-hmm. in terms of tokenistic he meant this, this was this was People using their ethnicity as a token. So we found, the, we just recently found the great great grandchildren are now going to school demanding that Bradford schools recognise Ukrainian cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and the issue of bringing food from, you know, because you know, other pu- 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 pupils in Bradford schools can do that. But the problem is, and this is one of the things that we're working on, there's no, nothing that's particularly you know, different about Ukrainian cuisine from, say, Polish cuisine. Hungarian cuisine to be perfectly honest, and it's all just pop art and stuff. For many cases, yeah, for many cases, I saw past the full flow of potato. You know, it's all the food groups one. Um, but you know, Hungarians, yeah. that sort of notion oh, yeah, of yeah. specialness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 
it's now quite different from, uh, yeah. it's quite interesting talking to grandparents about that because they're like, why did you go around to? And I'm uh, quite proud of you, but I'm sure you push it. I know. Well, yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, I was just saying to Veruca actually before we started, my husband obviously was born in the 60s and went to school in Scotland in the 70s. And he, because of the way he was treated at school, like a dirty walk, yeah, yeah. he wouldn't let me give our kids Italian names. Which was entirely ludicrous because there it's local schools now filled with yeah. na- every nationality from across the globe. Mm. Mm. But he I'm had sure that anxiety. Mm. Well, yeah, oh, my gosh. husband, my, my son, you know, wants to wear his Italian football yeah. shirt, wants to do Italian language. Mm. Well, you know, yeah. so it's yeah. even in that... <laughs> So, no, no, but he just felt anxious. He said, it's bad, he said, this is his quote, it's bad enough he's got the surname. Why would we give him an Italian name? And that's the hangover for him. That is interesting when he's, you know, he was born in the 60s, you know, which I think, not that actually. Yeah, he felt like he was making our child a target, an unnecessary target. Um, I interviewed this senior guy as part of this project uh, in 2006. I was looking at uh, people from Emilia Romagna that settled in London uh-huh. against Sicilians that came over in the post-war period to work in the glass house industry. And all their children, the second generation, were obviously bartering for the parents, you know, getting mortgages and sorting everything out. Um, one of these children, the second generation I interviewed, he's a school teacher now, and he said that they had such bad expectations of the children in school that most of them became hairdressers and mechanics. And he fought very, very hard to go on and do something different. But these were the expectations. They thought they were stupid, basically. Mm-hmm. Which is not that dissimilar to what happened to the Bengali children you know, yeah, in the yeah, 80s yeah. in East yeah. London. Yeah. So it's not, I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, but I think racism in this yeah. country is very subtle and, and that's happening in schools. I think so. I think so. Absolutely no, I going agree. on. And actually, I think that you talk today is mm-hmm. kind of relevant when we think about UKIP now and what yeah. they're doing about mm-hmm. being European. So the ones that came over late, like me, all of a sudden we have become the other. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. So, anyway. Definitely. Although racism in Italy is not subtle. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's there too. Completely yeah. open. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's open. Yeah. <laughs> Going to say about the last comment, I think you know, the expectations of you know, children do this, it's not just racism, there's, there's the class element as well, because children from working class backgrounds, well, that's what they're going to do. And children from middle class, oh, they could go to university. Yeah, they so were disadvantaged because they didn't speak uh, English at yes, home. Yes, I think it, it, it's there mm-hmm. as well, yeah. but I think it also it isn't just a, race, a racist issue. Mm. That's just a lot of the people I interviewed talked about being looked down on at school as yeah. ice cream people. Mm. You know, that they felt that there was that class dimension too, that they were okay. considered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which actually means echo and poco. Yeah, yeah. yeah it yeah. is a little, a little bit of ice cream. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think the class element, you're absolutely right. It's, 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 yeah, that's really that. That's what's powerful the story you tell when because of the people who got vested interest in the Nora Star, as you say, mm-hmm. were actually the elites yeah. of the community and pushed that one fifth has pushed the story across mm-hmm. for everybody. Um, it, it makes me weep sometimes when you just see it over and over again. You know, in the media, because mm-hmm. you know, journalists are notoriously lazy, so they will mm-hmm. go to the same people. Yeah. And so they just get this is what happened. During the war, there's the famous family, the Crowlers, whose father, grandfather, happened to be the fascist secretary up on that picture uh, in Edinburgh. And they go on about, you know, the delicatessen's really famous, and at the fringe they put on plays in the back, and everyone goes and they say things like, you know, we keep the shutter down at the front of the shop to signify the awful things that happened during the war. And I'm thinking, your family's half responsible. You know, if he hadn't have gone round and actively recruited for the fascists... <laughs> Half of those men wouldn't have been on the boat. Do you know? But you see what I mean? It's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's but this kind of oh, you know, so we keep the shutter down. Why were they focused on this so much? Just they didn't at first. Everyone kept very quiet for a long time. It's only the 1980s, and again, I think that's part of the anniversary of the Second World War. Oh, right. That attack. They felt quite safe. I think by the 1980s to say, well, this is what happened to us. This is our memory of the war. There was an Italian priest in Scotland who travelled to Colonsey in the islands, the Outer Hebrides, and began to track the bodies that had washed up. This is what happened, lots of unidentified bodies washed up. 
um, and there's all graves, you know, unknown Italian. And so he began to campaign for a knighthood, <laughs> an Italian knight, a cavaliere, mm. for survivors of the Arendora Star. Again, this mystifies me. Do you see what I mean? It's yeah, like. Yeah, it's, I think when you go to the 80s, people forget. Yeah, yes. You know, the, the veterans of the Second World yeah. War are no longer, yes. you know, yeah. insufficient numbers and making a noise about this for example. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's about safety, and I think a safe distance in time. Yeah. Uh, and then more confident people get. And then it's a very empathetic, the British response, as you can see, it's all, you know, Liverpool, Middlesbrough, everybody mm-hmm. wants their mm-hmm. piece of the story. Yeah, you know, there's some powerful thing I'm working on is about U boats and. So the very fact that Dora Star was sunk by a U boat mm-hmm. is, you know, again, there's nothing going, you know, never mind, you know, hold on, but U boat is sinking some million ships, isn't that wrong? You know, yeah, you, know, yeah. you can reach that far, yeah, story, which is bizarre. I know. You know? I know it's never about, it's funny, it's never about the German U <laughs> boat, it's about the British government were to blame. <laughs> Yeah. It's a bit like what happens in in Italy when they talk about the cave massacres by the Nazis, yeah. and often the children of those people who were shot will blame the resistance, yeah. the Italian resistance, because they said if you hadn't have been doing that thing, if you hadn't have thrown that bomb at the Germans, our people wouldn't have been shot. You know what I mean? It's yeah, an interesting. Do shoot <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they get sort of forgotten. So yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, is, is that, are they being probably yes. And oh, there was, the, yeah, the Welsh man who'd been in the British Guard, you know, there was an army guard on board, so there was a last surviving army man turned up at Liverpool. Um, but I've done a joint article with Gavin Schaffer, who writes a lot on the Jewish community, and what we explored in the article was why do the Jewish, lots of Jewish refugees from Germany died on that boat. <laughs> Why does the Jewish community not use the Arundora Star? And what we argue is they were so grateful to the British government for allowing them to be in Britain that they don't need a stick to berate the British government. Well, they may also think that the submarine might have been at fault as well. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, whereas with the Italians, what's happened is it's become a, a useful story of suffering and their grief to define. Mm. To tell a story about mm. what happened and then we forget the the yeah. beforehand. And also, it's kind of much more dramatic than breaking the windows and yeah. shops and things, mm. which is harder to make because it happened in lots of places, yeah. and lots of yeah. shops, yeah. And lots of yeah. businesses, yeah. and it was much more dispersed. Yeah. Whereas this is one nice, I mean, newspapers always want a nice little, yeah, yeah, you know, watertight story. How are you going to make a commemorat- yeah. commemorialization of lots of shops and lots of businesses over lots of months? Yeah. I mean, maybe it's hard. Yeah. You're thinking, oh, this is a good one to. But it's also hard for the story, isn't it? If you start talking about racism, yeah. <laughs> it's not something dealing with your own son. Yeah. Mm. So well, yeah, 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 because the yeah. people involved yeah, in the riots yeah, become yeah. implicated, yeah. whereas with the Arundora star, it is yeah. just yeah, a yeah, nice, it's almost an isolation. Yeah. Um, and the and fact that they were sending. The government, then it's like, you know, you're blaming the government. Yeah. You're yeah. Not honoring yeah, exactly. The exactly. Depersonalised. And, and, and what I know about the people that were on the Arandora Star, the, uh, Arandora Star um, the 446, uh, quite a number of those were from the Italian quarter here. Mm-hmm. So they wouldn't know each other. Obviously, they, they owned the businesses, so the men were taken away and they never turned. So mm-hmm. they obviously augments with this sort of psychic scarring that you talk about. Everyone you talk to, talk about, they talk yeah. about the psychological scar of the Arandora star because their friend, their granddad, or son, so, you know, they experienced it. The, the Italian community was broken mm. because they didn't come back. Huh? Mm. So this mm. is it. So it's not the same as being interned in this sense, isn't it? Yeah. So it did actually really affect people's lives. They just didn't talk about it, but it did happen yeah. and everyone knows about it. Yeah. There's these letters in the Scottish uh, Home Department. Actually, the mother of the two sisters, amazingly, I found her letters, um, and she's, she's trying to get compensation for a smash shop, but she couldn't, she was relocated, so she wasn't there, so she couldn't do anything, and she just says, um, how can my husband help me when you didn't give him a chance to live? And it's this awful, poignant, and there's more, there's other letters from widows saying, I can't, I can't cope because you've killed my husband, you know. 
So I think you're right, it's something that had a massive, mm-hmm. massive impact. Did you see any documentation from those that survived? They were sent on to another camp? I, I remember seeing photographs. Yeah, in my, in my family, the Hugolini family, uh, was a survivor of the Arundel Star. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul's, my husband's great uncle, survived the Arundel Star, got put on the Daenerys, this notorious ship where they all got harassed, went to Australia, <laughs> and then his son was going, got called up, and he was free to go because this leaves out the war, and his wife said, no, stay, stay there. And he said, no, I want to see my son in case he dies. And so he sailed from Australia and got torpedoed and died. So I don't, I haven't, you know, there are other stories yeah. beyond the Arundel Star yeah. as yeah. well. You know, people lost it. And yeah. There's lots of mental illness actually, which I only very, didn't really go, didn't push that, but that emerged as a theme. A lot of fathers who did return were actually quite broken. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sort of, yeah, that kind of barbed wire mental illness and sort mm-hmm. of the whole experience mm-hmm. of being deprived of your family and mm-hmm. you know but again it was second hand you know people telling me this and again it was it wasn't my focus I know that sounds yeah, harsh yeah, so sure. you kind of it's it, another narrative that runs against the narrative of lucky survivor mm-hmm. you know because you know yeah interesting <laughs> have you got any other questions I was going to ask you I'm going to ask you if you're thinking about something, I'm going to ask you about the cultural memory approach. Alright. Yeah, that's not bloody allergic to this. Where did the cultural, where did this cultural history stuff come from then? The cultural memory. When did this come about? Well, the phrase is from, well, you mean literally? Yeah, well, maybe literally. I'm not sure if I mean literally. I mean, there's a lot of about it. Mm-hmm. People are talking about cultural history, but I can't tell what the difference between cultural history and social history. Mm. I suppose, yeah, I suppose what they're trying to, I suppose because they say cultural memory, it's just trying to get across to people who don't, I suspect it's people who don't do oral history. Yeah. So to get across that it's a bit more multi-layered than just recording people's stories, that will, it's about the interplay of memory with the past. Yeah. And then it's about representations. I suppose, I, I'm just suspecting, so like in my work, it's also about how the community's been represented. So that kind of makes a sense rather than say I'm doing an oral history. I mean, I think it's useful. But yeah. I think it's, I think it's emerged as a, as, a, as a historical construct, construct itself. <laughs> it's my pro point, you know. But I didn't really see it coming. But do people talk about it a lot? I mean, I just that's just no, I pulled no. from Summerfield and Peniston Bird. But yeah, but I suspect they're borrowing from the spider sort of cultural history mm. when this occurred. You know, it's so, sort so, I mean, it's it's from field man stuff from my point of view. But it's some of the colleagues who are using that. But say, what do you mean? What's cultural history? Isn't that what we've been doing anyway? Yeah. What differentiates that work from the other work? It seems to be something about a feeling that social history turns to quantitative techniques or. Yeah, so it, it, yeah. Well, they thought they just think it's from your sort of history and probably that sort of question. You know, so I just keep on asking. Them. I'm just saying, I'm just thinking about a colleague who works just been made a professor and she's a professor of social and cultural history. Yeah, see, so what's the difference? Yeah. See, see, that's what I mean. What the hell is the difference? Let's put in touch with, you, with your colleague, shall we? Should put them in touch. If culture doesn't sit in society, where the hell does it yeah. sit? You know? I think it is, it's about, I, th- I suspect, because she works a lot in textiles and material yeah, exactly. culture. So, yeah, yeah, but. but so for a tea box, that's what we're introduced to. <laughs> <laughs> so she's probably flagging up that interest too, that it's just not just about yeah, recovering the past, it's about it's material bringing, culture. yeah, representation. Yeah, material culture. But that's why it's interesting then, people are talking about cultural memory, whether there's a link as well there to stuff like material culture and thinking about. It. We're thinking more about. Maybe we should be thinking more about the stuff that people keep. You know, the sort of commemoration stuff. And t- and, and, you know, because it strikes me that we don't really do a lot of that in interviewing. Mm. But I see people do keep enormous amounts of crap. Um, you know, I, I do at least. Um, but you know, what's on people's mantelpieces? Why they kept stuff? You know, it's to ask more about that. Thing. Yeah. You know, people mm. do this sort of stuff. The sort of stuff coming out from Russia. Where people do doing a lot of that. People. people I was always nervous of that. Maggie Mackay was my supervisor. She had um, a little piece of sort of charcoal from a Befana, and she said, "Oh, take that out and see if it 
provokes memories, but I never did. Yeah. Was she Italian? No, no, I just felt I felt like it was imposing what yeah. we maybe thought was important. Yeah, I so I didn't. Yeah. I was thinking, yeah, I was more what they've got. Yeah. Well, yeah. Give you as well. Coffee usually. Yeah. 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 Italian <laughs> Okay, so in each region of Italy we have different kinds of alcohol. Grappa is only in the north, Limoncello is only in the south, so let's not do stereotyping. <laughs> 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 I think he buys more fuel than you should buy drunk. But yeah, again, thinking about it, we even thinking about that, you know. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, it was a big part actually of doing the. But I, I thought that yes. about yeah. that when I went to yeah. people's homes. Yeah. I didn't yeah. see yeah. their homes that different yeah. from uh, other homes. It's yeah. not as typical as a Caribbean home or something. Uh-huh. You know, the front room of the Italians I interviewed weren't mm-hmm. really that different. You couldn't find anything apart from maybe St. Mary's. Yeah, just a few religious. Few religious, religious things. Things. I do remember someone had a, well, the woman I told you about who lost her dad from Australia, she had a memorial card, yeah, the yeah. memorial mass, and it's, she translated it because it was in Italian, and it did say, you, you were drowning, but you were rescued to the coast, and then, but death was waiting for you in the Atlantic. Mm. 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 Her mum, she said her mum was so bitter that she emigrated to America after the war. Mm. She was so angry. Mm. Does anybody want a glass of wine? That'd be nice. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Fantastic.